this meeting of the Judiciary, Finance, and Civil Law Committee to order. We are holding this remote hearing under House Rule 10.01. Uh, we will start with the roll. Uh, Anna, please go ahead. Chair Becker Finn. Present. Representative Muller. Present. Representative Scott, excused. Representative Feist. Present. Representative Fraser. Present. Representative Grossel. Representative Hurd. Present. Representative Hollins. Present. Representative Johnson. Present. Representative Liebling. Present. Representative Long. Present. Representative Mortensen. Present. Representative Novotny. Present. Representative Farr. Present. Representative Robbins. Present. Representative Vang. Present. Representative Zhang. Present. Representative Grossel, uh, present. All right, Representative Grossel is present. Uh, My quorum is A quorum is present. Uh, first order of business is uh, the minutes from yesterday. Uh, uh, Representative Liebling. Um, thank you, Madam Chair. And um, I noted, um, I, first of all, I would move approval of the minutes, but I, I would like to uh, offer a correction if I could. My name was missed in the roll. So, so you know, I looked at them. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> All right. Uh, so with that correction, uh, all those in favor of uh, approving the minutes, please say aye. 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 Opposed? All right. The minutes are approved. Thank you, Representative Liebling. Uh, members, first uh, first bill on our agenda today is House File 108. It is a Representative Noor bill. Uh, I will just note that we're going to focus on the provisions that are within the jurisdiction of this committee. Uh, welcome to the committee, uh, Chair Noor. Uh, I will move that House File 108 be recommended to be placed on the general register. The bill is now before us. Uh, Chair Noor, please tell us about your bill. Uh, good morning and thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, this bill prohibits employers from requesting or using credit information as a condition of employment for hiring, firing, promotion, or compensation determination, or in any way or shape or form that affects the terms and conditions of their employment. Can you imagine being denied a job because of your credit information due to financial hardships, especially during COVID-19 pandemic, where many people are unable to pay their bills on time, and then also being told that you cannot get an employment. Can you imagine being denied a job because of inaccurate reporting on your credit information? This is a process that is being used by many employers to deny well-qualified candidates an opportunity to have a job and maybe, and maybe to be able to pay their debt. Credit information includes credit score or history, credit account balance, payment history, or saving or checking account balances or account numbers. Madam Chair and members, this is truly an invasion of individuals' privacy. There are several exceptions, including in this bill, if the information is required under state or federal law, or if there are any uh, valid businesses needed for the information. This bill excludes financial institutions and credit union employer, peace officers, financial managers position, or position involving routine access to confidential financial or personal information, large cash transactions, or financial fiduciary responsibility. The bill provides a private civil course of action for violations. An injured employee may seek damages as well as injective relief and reasonable attorney's fees and costs. That's the section that we have focused on this article in this committee. The data shows that when credit information is used in hiring, it disproportionately impacts BIPAC job applicants. Prospective employees are not customers of credit reporting agencies. In fact, they are the product. Credit reporting agencies package up consumers' data to sell to lenders, employers, landlords, insurers, and other businesses. In fact, over 40% of employers today use some form of credit information in determining 
their hiring process or purposes. Today, credit information is not only used by the lenders as it was used, but for everyone who needs it for any purposes. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Uh, I ask for your support for this bill. Thank you so much. I stand ready to answer any questions that you may have. All right, thank you, Chair Noor. Uh, members, any questions uh, regarding uh, subdivision 1D? Uh, Representative Long. Thank you, Madam Chair. I uh, don't have a question. I just have a very brief comment, which is that I uh, strongly support this bill and uh, actually just received a, uh, an email from a constituent yesterday um, who was denied uh, employment because of a failed credit check. And um, I thought I would just read uh, three sentences from the email that they sent. He said he's 34, he's been unemployed, and he thought he had a position lined up perfectly, position doing IT help desk work. The 11th hour, he received a call from uh, the employer that they were choosing not to go ahead because of a failed credit check. Credit isn't good enough for them. I went through a very expensive program at school that didn't work out in the end for medical reasons. And I suppose that having a large number of student loans just wasn't okay for them. So this is an individual who was working in IT um, and was denied because they had too many student loans. So I just wanted to give that one constituent face for the, this problem and really appreciate Representative Noor, you, you bringing this important bill forward. Uh, thank you, Representative Long, uh, for sharing that uh, good example of the difference this bill could make. Uh, members, any other questions regarding uh, House File 108? All right. Uh, seeing none, I will renew my motion that House File 108 be recommended to be placed on the General Register. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Beckerson. Aye. Representative Moeller. Aye. Representative Scott, excused. Representative Feist. Aye. Representative Frazier. Aye. Representative Grossel. Representative Grossel. Aye. Representative Hurt. Aye. Representative Hollins. Aye. Representative Johnson. Aye with reservations. Representative Liebling. Aye. Representative Long. Aye. Representative Mortensen. No. Representative Novotny. Pass. Representative Farn. No. Representative Robbins. Aye. Representative Fang. Aye. Representative Zhang. Aye. Okay. There are 13 ayes, two nays, and one abstention. Uh, the motion prevails, and House File 108 is uh, on its way to the General Register. Uh, Chair Noor, I apologize I didn't let you uh, have a, a final closing. Is there anything else uh, you'd like to share with us about this bill? I appreciate it. Uh, thank you so much uh, to, to you, Madam Chair and members. Right. Thank you, uh, Chair Noor, uh, and thank you for, for coming before our committee and being prepared this morning right away. Uh, next bill on our agenda is House File 2124. This is a Representative Keeler bill. Uh, members, our discussion will be uh, regarding the relevant provision related to data. Uh, Representative Keeler, uh, welcome to our committee. I will move that House File 2124 be recommended to be referred to the Public Safety and Criminal Justice Reform Committee. Uh, Representative Keeler, please tell us about your bill. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, as many of you have probably heard in other presentations, we um, had a task force for murdered and missing Indigenous women. And from that task force, we're moving forward to um, hopefully implement an office that will oversee what we're now calling MMIR, which is murdered and missing Indigenous relatives uh, for the inclusion factor. And so one of the main things that we've all talked about um, and why this is so important is the lack of data and the lack of data collection and sharing for us to know and understand um, how this is really affecting all of our communities, but then also how we gain that collection, share it with state and federal organizations and at that level, but more importantly, how we share that with our tribes. Um, you know, with the data, it tells a story that we all know is there um, that we can build upon, um, share in a safe way, as you see um, that this is something that needs to be built and shared out so that we can continue to keep um, our, our indigenous sisters and brothers and relatives safe. 
Um, as we continue to learn about it, the more and the better that we can do. So with that, we, I do think I have one testifier with me today. Yep. Uh, thank you, Representative Keeler. I have uh, Catherine Weeks. Uh, please introduce yourself for the record and go ahead with your testimony. Good morning, Chair and members. My name is Kate Weeks. I'm the Executive Director of the Office of Justice Programs with the Department of Public Safety. Uh, our role in the MMIW task force was to help support the work of that task force. Um, as Representative Keeler said, the 2020 MMIW task force report contains many recommendations on how to best stress a, this epidemic. One of the primary mandates is an MMIR office to continue to address the root causes and systems and practices that perpetuate this issue. The task force identified numerous ways that data will enhance the understanding of this issue, identify where gaps in data perpetuate the epidemic, and show progress in addressing the systemic issues in Minnesota. Data is essential for the MMIR office to act on these recommendations made in the report and to meet the requirements of this legislation, including reporting back to the legislature. Uh, Representative Keeler really captured uh, the need for this uh, very well, so I'm, I can stand for questions. Great, thank you, uh, Ms. Weeks. Uh, members, discussion to the bill. Uh, Representative Robbins. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Keeler. You know, on the section of access to data, I just wondered, there's no um, retention policy in that subdivision eight. There's nothing about audit trails you know, channeling Peggy Scott, who is not with us this morning, I just want to um, ask if you would consider adding some guardrails around that. There doesn't seem to be any um, language other than that this person has access to the data. Uh, Representative Keeler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Representative Robbins. I, I actually was looking forward to Representative Scott's input on this because I know as we've been in other committees, um, that's one of the things she brings up, but absolutely. Um, and I know that I have a meeting, I think, with you to follow up, and maybe it's one of the things that we can um, kind of add to the docket for us to talk about, um, because as it's been brought to my attention, I agree. I think it's something that we need to add. Uh, thank you. And I, I will note that we're sending this to public safety. So there is uh, time for uh, folks to have conversations and work on making an even better bill. Uh, any follow-up, Representative Robbins? Uh, Representative Johnson. Uh, Chair becker Finn, uh, Representative Keeler. On this, uh, there looks like there's like, going to be a lot of private and uh, confidential corrections and detention data, as well as the uh, possibility of medical data. Um, could you explain why they need this information to perform the duties? Uh, Representative Keeler, or I'm not sure if... Uh, Ms. Uh, Weeks may be the, the best person to answer that question. Um, I think, uh, Madam Chair, so Representative Johnson, you're asking as we build an office around the data for murdered and missing Indigenous women, why we need medical information. I just want to make sure I'm understanding your question. Uh, Representative Johnson. Yeah, in the bill, it talks about medical data as well. Um, and confidential corrections and detention data. I'm just wondering what data you're going to be collecting and also how long you're going to be keeping that data that in order to perform the duties for the uh, uh, the person in charge and, and for that, that office to do its work. Uh, Representative Keeler. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for the question, Representative Johnson. I think that um, as we talk about any situations of, around any populations that are murdered or go missing, there's an element of medical documentation that needs to be provided. Um, as we know, and as we look at these stories, these awful stories, that when individuals um, have been abducted or taken, often there's physical harm that's done as well. And so we're not looking at like all of the medical history that they've ever had, but a lot of this and a lot of the stories that are being told implement have implications around their physical well-being. Um, I will give one example that happened in my community with Savannah Greywind um, that as she was taken, 
Um, I don't know if you're familiar with this story and why this is so important to our communities, but her baby was cut out of her stomach. That is a medical part of this huge epidemic that we have. So, I mean, I think that as we move forward, we need to be mindful that this is awful. This is an awful thing that's happening to our communities. And so, of course, we would need to have access to the medical piece of it. Um, and also any of the any of the other background that tells the full entire story. As far as your question with how long this data will be used, um, I mean, I think that it would be used it, in the space of being able to open cold cases. That's one of the things that this um, office is also going to do. And so I, um, the, the, the link, the length um, of which we would utilize this data, I'm not completely sure of. Maybe Mrs. Weeks, you know that. Uh, Ms. Weeks. Chair members, um, I think one of the pieces that the uh, report really touched on is the inadequacy of the data that is available. Um, one of the things that the MMIR office is tasked with doing is really making sure that we're correct collecting and maintaining and looking at accurate data and what that means um, so that systems are tracking this epidemic so that the MMIR office, in addition to state agencies, federal, local, are um, changing policies and practices to better serve uh, Indigenous communities to stop this epidemic. As for retention, uh, Representative Keeler did mention that she is willing to talk about that. Uh, the state does have retention records, um, policies and practices, so that would still apply to this office. Um, and it doesn't look like the classification of the data changes. So it would still remain private and confidential. Uh, thank you, Ms. Weeks. Uh, let's see, next on the list is uh, Represent uh, Vice Chair, Chair Moeller. Oh, Representative Johnson. Yeah, I, I just had uh, one more question with some of the data that uh, was brought up here. Uh, some of this data, is, it looks like it's gonna be investigative data uh, that's looking at, and a lot of that is very confidential, dealing with the investigations, uh, very limited access as uh, investigate, current and ongoing investigations is protected uh, very closely to make sure information is not leaked to the public where uh, on certain crimes that only the uh, perpetrator would actually know. Um, are they going to have access to the investigative data as well as the, the investigation itself? Uh, so, Representative Johnson, I will just clarify. If folks will look at line point at 4.4, it has access to corrections and detention data and medical data maintained by an agency, and that data will still be maintained as private or confidential data. So there's no mention whatsoever of investigative data in the bill. Uh, Representative Keeler, I don't know if you have anything additional to follow up. All right, any additional questions, Representative Johnson? No, that would be the reason I brought that up because they've talked about cold cases. If the cold cases they're working on, that is still investigative data. So I just wanted to clarify to make sure that they're not going to be um, getting getting access and and making sure that investigative investigative data on ongoing investigations is not released. Thank you. All right, thank you. Uh, Vice Chair Moeller. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Keeler, for bringing this bill. I think it's a great bill. And um, I also noticed that the executive director is a member of the Minnesota State Retirement Association, meaning that they are a state employee and they're still subject to all, I think it's been brought up, they're still subject to all the other protections in Chapter 13, including 1309, which provides for penalties if data is improperly shared. And I think it's important to just remember that 1309 exists um, elsewhere in statute, and it, it is a good guardrail. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you, Vice Chair Muller, for that uh, reminder. It's always good to have folks who've got more of the, the data background, which is why we have the bills coming to our committee. Um, not seeing any other hands. Uh, closing words, uh, Representative Keeler. Thank you, Madam Chair and members. Um, I've taken many notes in this short conversation because as like we've mentioned, um, we do want to make this the best bill that we possibly can um, so that we can move forward in this work. This is meaningful work and this is something that we absolutely need to stand behind. Um, I think every single one of us have 
indigenous relatives in our communities. This is not something that just happens in our tribal um, lands and in tribal nations. And so this is a statewide, nationwide epidemic. So I appreciate your support um, and I look forward to moving, moving forward together to make this the best bill that we can. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Representative Keeler. Uh, with that, I will renew my motion that House File 2124 be recommended to be referred to the Public Safety and Criminal Justice Reform Committee. The clerk will take the roll. Chair Becker Finn. Aye. Representative Moeller. Aye. Representative Scott, excused. Representative Feiss. Aye. Representative Frazier. Aye. Representative Grossel. Representative Grossel. Representative Hur. Aye. Representative Hollins. Aye. Representative Johnson. Aye. Representative Liebling. Aye. Representative Lee. Aye. Representative Mortensen. No. Representative Novotny. Aye. Representative Aye. 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 Representative Robbins. Aye. Representative Fang. Aye. Representative Zhang. Aye. Representative Grossel. Aye. Right. There are 15 ayes and one nay. Thank you. With that, the motion prevails and House File 2124 is on its way to the Public Safety Committee. Thank you very much uh, for this really important work, Representative Keeler. Um, you know, when we when we set up task forces, uh, it's really only valuable if we then move forward with the recommendations that come out of those task forces. So I think this is a really good first step. And I'm glad that uh, we're moving quickly in, in making these uh, recommendations from the task force reality. So thank you very much, Representative Keeler. Uh, last bill on the agenda today is uh, Representative Herr. Uh, so this is uh, House File 972 regarding interpreter pay and reimbursement. Uh, we amended the bill on March 16th, which was still this week, um, and uh, laid it over and we, we ran out of time. And so uh, we are bringing the bill back up uh, so we can finish our discussion of this bill. Uh, Representative Herr, would you like to move your bill, uh, House File 972, as amended? All right, uh, Representative Her, I think your now. video is. Can you hear you me? Might now, need to turn off your. I can hear you now. Yep. Would you like to move your bill? Let me just try to. May need to. Yes, Madam may Chair. need to turn Send off me. your video. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Thank you, uh, Representative Her. Moves nine seven two as amended, and we do have some uh, test fires that we weren't able to get to earlier this week. So. Uh, Representative Herr, uh, please tell us about your bill or we can go straight to the test fires, whatever you'd prefer. And Madam Chair, and I'll, I'll just repeat really quickly that um, there is, you know, uh, the interpreters have not received, the court interpreters have not received a pay increase in over 20 years. They received a small one back in 2017 and that only increased their rate by $2 or uh, a really small percentage, 4%. And other interpreters uh, within uh, the system uh, are uh, $20 ahead of them per hour. And so that's just a quick summary. And then I would like to turn it over to our testifiers who were not able to testify last time. And with us today, we do have, there, it's been, there's been a little bit of a change, but we do have Sally um, that is here with us. And I can turn it over to her first. All right, uh, Sally, Sally, yep, sorry, Sally, uh, please introduce yourself for the record and then go ahead with your testimony. Thank you. My name is Sally Nichols. I'm a certified Spanish interpreter, and I work in as a as a freelance interpreter in the Minnesota state court system. And the reason for this bill is, as Representative Her pointed out, our wages have been really frozen for a long time. When I first moved to Minnesota in 1999, I was making more or less what I'm making now, and I was a single mother back then. But I was able to support myself. Um, I'm still a single mother now, and we did receive a $2 increase, as Representative Hurst said, in 2017, but it's a, it's a, it was a minimal amount. It was 4%, and that was after almost about 20 years, you know, and nothing since then. So as a, 
as uh, wa- as inflation goes up, that our wages don't go up, we continuously struggle to stay in this profession, which we really love. And we believe we're a very strong and important part of the court system. But I routinely and many other interpreters routinely am struggling and juggling between paying my taxes, which are significantly higher as a freelancer, paying my health care, which is significantly higher as a freelancer, and paying my mortgage, which is no, no higher than anyone else's. <laughs> but it used to be I was able to do all those things. Now I'm always behind on at least one of them, which means that I have to face a decision, as so many of my colleagues do, about whether I can afford to stay in this profession and or whether I need to move on and do other things, which many of my colleagues have. Uh, we've been unofficially keeping uh, tabs on the interpreters in the roster by periodically calling them all and emailing them all. And since we began doing that about two years ago, we've lost at least 20% of the interpreters who were available for interpreting on the roster. They've all left to do other things uh, for different reasons, but the main reason was the lack of ability to support themselves as a freelance court interpreter. That's pretty much the extent of my testimony, and I would be happy to answer any questions that anyone has. All right, thank you, Uh, Ms. Nichols. uh, Next on the list, I have Edith Hansich. Uh, Edith, if you could introduce yourself for the record and go ahead with your testimony. Yes, uh, good morning. Uh, My name is Edith Gamero de Hansich, uh, and I wanna thank you for for having me, hearing me testify this morning. Um, my name is Edith Gamero de Hansos, as I said, and I have been a judicial interpreter for the past 16 years. And I have been working, uh, uh, I, I mean, I decided to take the rigorous training and test to obtain my certification because I have a profound respect of the judicial system of the United States of America. It is clear that my job is not only important, but that it is essential in ensuring that there is justice available for all. During these years, I have witnessed how outcomes have drastically changed with with the precision of my interpretation inside of the courtroom in cases where in the interest of saving time or money or out of sheer ignorance, a child or a friend or a family member of a party involved in a case had been used to interpret part of the proceeding um, that takes place outside of the courtroom. And that is why, in spite of earning close to the same income that I that that was established uh, 20 years ago, I continue working in this profession. And because I have a partner who has provided a steady income and the benefits uh, for our family, I urge you to appropriate the money that can finally bring interpreters to a point of not having to decide uh, to continue working in our profession or putting food on the table. Thank you. Thank you very much for your testimony. And last, uh, we have April Cedillo. Uh, April, if you could introduce yourself for the record and then go ahead with your testimony. Good morning. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is April Cedillo, and I'm a state certified Spanish interpreter, and I've been so for the last 20 years. I'm also the owner of a boutique interpreting agency called Link Interpret. We've been open for 12 years, and we provide judicial interpreters to private law firms. Um, I actually am appearing this morning as an expert witness, and I would be happy to answer any questions that uh, representatives may have about the bill. All right, thank you. Uh, We do have a couple of questions. Uh, Representative Novotny. Uh, Thank you, Madam Chair. Serious, uh, curious question. Uh, Who actually does the certification? What's the difference between certified and non-certified? Is there, if they're not certified, is there still some level of um, education or expertise? Yes, Representative. Uh, this is April Cidio. Uh, Ms. Oh. Ms. Cidio. Thank you, Madam Chair. I would be happy to answer that question for you. 
Certified interpreters have gone through rigorous training and have passed a rigorous exam to become certified. Um, it is less than 20% of candidates who take the test actually pass the test. Um, and the state does the certification process. Right now we have certification for several languages. Um, there is a second level for interpreters who are not certified, and those are called roster interpreters. They're on the state roster as having passed their ethics exam and having passed a background check and having um, passed an orientation for the state. But roster interpreters actually have taken no language testing to ensure the accuracy of their interpreting skills. A uh, follow-up, Representative Novotny? Uh, that's fine. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, and Madam Chair, can I just add a quick follow-up? Yep, Representative Her. And I just wanted to say that there is a pay deferential between the court, uh, the certified interpreters, and then and the roster interpreters. And so, um, just to, for people to be aware that they're not paid the same rate. Very good. Thank you, Representative Her. Uh, Vice Chair Moeller. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, Representative Her, for this bill. I think it's really important, and I do have a couple questions. Um, I'm curious first about where we are with receiving the fiscal note from the courts, and I don't know if um, if anybody from the courts is on the call, or maybe Mr. Walls can speak to that, or maybe you know, Representative Her, where we are with that. Uh, Representative Her. Thank you, Madam Chair, and thank you, uh, Vice Chair Mulder, for the question. We have been working very closely with the courts. We are awaiting actually numbers from them. Uh, our uh, research, um, Mr. Ben Johnson, has actually been the one who has been in contact with them, and we have not received uh, the information as of about three days ago. All right, thank you. Um, is anybody from the courts here? Or does somebody from House Research um, have anything to add? Looks like uh, we, we, oh, Mr. Johnson. Uh, Madam Chair, members, just very briefly, we've been back and forth with the courts a few times. I don't understand all the ins and outs of the details, but they've been having some difficulty untangling the specific numbers needed here from some other numbers based on how they do their budgeting. Uh, Mr. Walls put in a uh, today, uh, which should help the courts to give specific numbers. And I believe he told me that there's a due date on that of this coming Monday. All right, thank you, uh, Mr. Johnson. Hopefully, ho hopefully the courts will uh, get the message that we need that information uh, as soon as possible. Uh, additional uh, follow-up. Vice Chair Moeller. Yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. Yes, and I do really hope the courts can get that information as soon as possible to us. Um, also just wanted to ask about the importance of in-person interpreting versus virtual. It's my understanding that interpreters often use um, body language and, uh, and to assist them in interpreting. And I would just like to hear from our testifiers about that. Thanks, Madam Chair. Um, I see Ms. Cedillo is nodding, so I'm gonna go to her first. <laughs> Representative Muller, I'd be happy to answer that question. It is much better for us interpreters to interpret in person. We do rely greatly on things besides for just the words that are spoken, such as body language. And to be able to see a person's whole body and to be there in person does help us pick up on those things. Of course, right now, during the pandemic, just like everybody else, we have been working over video. Um, I think we've done a really great job stepping up during the pandemic to continue providing equal access to justice in our court system. And I've been extremely proud of our colleagues for scrambling and learning so quickly how to do so. It's been so important. And we are greatly looking back to returning in person so that we can continue doing our important work. Uh, follow up, Vice Chair Moeller. That's all. Thanks, Madam Chair. All right, thank you. Uh, next on the list, Representative Johnson. Uh, Chair Becker Finn, Representative Her, I understand the need for this, but I see a need in a different way. First of all, I'd like to thank the testifiers that are here today. Uh, they do a valuable service to uh, our judicial system, not only in the courts, but also for the investigative side and the law enforcement. I've had to use them uh, numerous times. 
And which, unfortunately, it's going to get much worse. I would love to see many more interpreters that are certified. Uh, we need to figure out what we can do to get them certified. I was reading reading an article about the border crisis right now down in uh, Texas, uh, just at one station on a Sunday. They detained uh, Representative, over 1, Representative Johnson, the question before us today is whether we should increase pay for interpreters in the courts here in Minnesota. That is correct. That is why I'm getting to that point. If, if I can finish the reasoning, I would love, I will get to that. Okay, let's try to get to it. Yeah, there was over 1,000 detained, and more than that made it through without getting caught. But with our catch and release, with the border crisis down at the border and the crisis down there, those people are moving, and they're moving all over the country. And that was just one of 79 stations in Texas. We have uh, other states that are having the same issue. These people are going to be coming to Minnesota. We're going to be dealing with them. We need the interpreters. Uh, the question I have is with the border crisis and the need for many more interpreters, uh, not just for the courts, but for our law enforcement side of it, which uses the same interpreters generally, especially if it's an interrogation, they need them. And if there's more than one uh, suspect that they're interrogating, each suspect has their own interpreter. I had a case where I had to have five interpreters up here and it cost my department uh, a couple thousand dollars to have those interpreters up here uh, because of the distance they had to travel. We had to get one that had to come from almost 200 miles away to do the, inter do the interview with the suspect just because each one has to have their own interpreter. Um, when it comes to the courts, if there's multiple people involved, each one has their own interpreter. With the number that we have, we're in great need. Um, and you, as the uh, testifier said, there's many that are on the roster but aren't, are not certified, so they cannot be used uh, in the court systems, especially, or in the investigative services. Is, is uh, raising the pay actually going to help get more interpreters, or is that just to uh, set to help the ones that we have now? Because we we're going to need hundred uh, hundreds of more interpreters within the next year. I'm just wondering how that's going to going to work. Uh, Representative Her. Uh, Madam Chair, thank you. Uh, and Representative Johnson, I wanted to just take a stab at it first before I turn it over to uh, to April, but. I just want to be really clear that we actually narrowed the scope of this bill. Originally, this bill also included um, some additional components of it, and one of it had to do with uh, the certification of our court interpreters, that actually a roster interpreter can interpret in the court system too. So that's why there's a different pay range, but they have to, the objective is to go to a certified first. But since we don't have enough of them, the, you know, there's an issue of then when we move down to the, uh, to the rostered ones. But I do have to be uh, really honest that that is an issue, that the, when Representative Novotny asked who does the training for this and who provides it, it is our judicial branch that does this. But the problem is, is that there have not been um, the 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 services that have been provided for that have not been kept up. And so we actually have some specific languages that don't even have any certified interpreters. And so there is uh, also a request. There was a request for additional resources in order to continue to certify more interpreters. So that is something that we uh, included originally in this bill and we narrowed it because we thought it was important to get to, to not have something so broad. And so know that there will probably be more of our bills coming through to address the system, the issues with the court interpreters and getting uh, the number of interpreters up, but pay also becomes a barrier. And that's why this is the first piece that we're, uh, we narrowed it down to. Um, I don't know if April, if you wanna add to that as well. Uh, Ms. Cedillo. Thank you. Representative Johnson, I just want to thank you for your support and your interest in interpreting. And obviously, you understand how important our service is and the great need to have a level of interpreters to be able to co to do what we need to do professionally within the court system and the growing need. That's one of the reasons that we've brought this bill as interpreters, we have observed our colleagues are leaving this profession. 
And this has been extremely concerning to us. We see that our numbers are dwindling. As a person who runs an interpreting agency to provide judicial interpreters to private law firms, this has been something that I've been having problems with because it's the same pool of interpreters who do private work and who work for the courts. Interpreters are unable to make a living working for the courts because we haven't had a pay raise within the last 24 years. We have had 4% in 24 years, which is not enough to keep people in this very important profession. We're also seeing that we do not have new interpreters joining us in this profession because there is no incentive for them to do so. So what we are seeing is dwindling rates uh, dwindling numbers of certified interpreters to do this important work, and we are facing a very real crisis. If you, as you have rightly pointed out, we are not going to have the number of professionals to do this work if we can't pay these professionals at a professional rate. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Cedillo. Uh, and I, I will note before we get further in the discussion, I think it is important to just note that. Uh, we don't have control over uh, federal law and immigration policy, and I just want members to caution members to be careful in the way we we talk about other people. Um, and just because uh, someone may not be a citizen or is a newer immigrant, I just want to be careful in the way that we we speak about people and not make any assumptions about uh, you know criminality or or anything like that um, as we talk about uh, these folks who who live in our communities. And so I just think that I want to make sure that we're being careful in the way that we we talk about um, our fellow community members. Uh, any additional questions, Representative Johnson? Uh, Chair Becker Finn, Representative Kerr, um, and to the testifiers. Yeah, I, I see both sides of it. Um, the, the need for it. Um, I would love to make uh, 50, $60 an hour that the interpreters are making now, but I, I know that it's not a full-time job. So it's, it makes it a little uh, interesting how it works. Uh, but I think maybe we can't tell the courts what to do. Uh, maybe we need to look at the uh, certification process to make sure that uh, we will uh, be able to get the, those certifications is the certification to a point where now it's very it's a, a higher standard than we need. Per Although we want top quality interpreters, but we need to figure out how we can uh, get more of them into it at a at a cost that especially in a for the law enforcement side, the investigative side, uh, where they can afford to get the interpreters and do their job properly as well. Because when they call these interpreters on the law enforcement side, it's the local jurisdictions that pay for it. And we need to keep the cost re reasonable for them or some of these issues. It's gonna be very difficult to do a proper investigation and make sure that the constitutional rights of those suspects are protected. So it's, it's a very uh, I, careful balancing act. I, I will I will just note that we actually can tell the courts what to do. We are the legislature, um, and we can pass laws to tell them uh, what they need to do. Uh, Ms. Sadio. Two points. We have been working with the state courts, our group of interpreters, for over five years now. We have gone back and gone back and gone back, and we have... It, literally, it's been five years that we've been trying to work with them. And we have been unable to get the courts to get the funding that we need, which is why we're here with you now to ask for the funding that we need, working with the court system so that this can become a reality for us. Representative Johnson mentioned perhaps lowering the standards for interpreting so that we can have more interpreters working in our state courts. I would like to point out that the certification exam will pass an interpreter as long as they can pass three separate components of the test, each component at 70% accuracy. So a fully certified interpreter has only been proven to be 
minimally 70% accurate. I would ask the representative if he would like to have less competent interpreters working in our state courts when life and liberty are possibly at stake. I think that a better solution would be to increase pay to a livable wage and to market standards um, to get competent professionals working within our courts to provide equal access to justice. Uh, thank you, Ms. Cedillo. A final, final follow-up, Representative Johnson. Uh, Chair Becker, I had not uh, planned to speak again. Um, I did not say lower the standards. I said look at them to see if they are um, in a position where it's almost impossible, basically almost impossible to pass and very difficult. We want the best qualified, but we also want to make sure that our certification system is not obtainable. Um, and I, I will note, uh, as uh, in the work that I've done in, in my job, uh, particularly in the realm of domestic violence and the need for interpreters, that uh, when you don't have a highly skilled interpreter, it is uh, almost impossible to both do the investigation and um, to follow through with the court processes and to be, uh, you know, the details in really, really matter um, in in the courts as well as at, on the investigative side. And again, I'll just remind members that the question before us today is whether uh, court interpreter pay should be increased. And uh, with that, uh, Representative Her, I will give you the final word. Thank you, Chair Becker Finn, and thank you, committee members, for uh, hearing our. Uh, uh, bill sorry, today. Madam Chair, uh, I had my hand raised. This is Representative Grossel. Oh, I'm sorry, Representative Grossel. It was not raised on my screen. Uh, Representative Grossel. Thank you, Madam Chair. I, I hate to interrupt you guys, but <laughs> uh, and I'm having some difficulties with technical stuff this morning, so I apologize. Uh, my, I guess my question. It'll be very quick. Uh, as far as uh, who who puts the bill for this, am I understanding? that the courts fit the bill for this. This won't be an unfunded mandate that we're going to place on uh, counties that, that are already uh, struggling with, uh, with funding such things. Uh, I can actually answer that question, Representative Grossel. The reason this bill is before us and uh, not the Public Safety Committee is that this is uh, strictly related to uh, the Supreme Court budget and the court budgets as far as the cost to interpreters in the courts. Um, and so that is why we are laying it over and waiting on the fiscal note here in the Judiciary Committee. Uh, any quick follow-up, Representative Grossel? Uh, no, Madam Chair, uh, other than other than uh, when we, uh, you you made a good point as far as how we, how we uh, talk about our fellow man. And uh, when we use words like, uh, uh, racist and things like that flippantly. Um, that's it's not good. I mean, you you brought up the point uh, when Representative Johnson was trying to uh, say that there is a need and there is an influx of people coming into the country. Um, so it, it's it's we all try to do we all try to do the best we can to make sure that we uh, uh, use proper terminology when we're talking about our fellow man. So I just wanted to add that to the list of the things that you mentioned, which which were good points. Thank you. Yeah, uh, thank you, Representative Grossel. And I will note that um, pointing out that a policy or a statement is racist is not a personal attack on any person or group of people. It is a, uh, if folks are still confused about what racism and racist means, uh, I would I encourage you to go back and read the select committee uh, report uh, that came out uh, at the end of the year. It is a very valuable document with includes some definitions for folks if they're still confused uh, or need clarification on what that means. And now, Representative, her uh, closing comments. Thank you, uh, Chair Becker Finn and, and committee uh, for letting us um, have this bill come before you and hearing it again. I did just wanna address a couple of things really quickly before we, we close today that I know um, Representative Johnson mentioned how he would like to make $50 an hour too. And I, I wanna just reiterate that after paying taxes, fees and expenses, that the effective rate for an interpreter who is interpreting in a court uh, 15 miles away, so that's usually three hours total interpreter time, is only $18.51. And when you and the effective pay for those that are the assignments that are 30 miles away is only $10.94. And I think that we all know very well that when you are uh, working uh, as a contractor in this way or uh, as an independent individual in this way, that you don't get to keep the whole $50. And so I just want us to be really clear about 
about that. And the other two is just to reiterate that we have actually been working with the courts and they were and the interpreters were working long before I was. And that we've been really respectful of knowing that our judicial branch is a separate branch of government. And though that we appropriate the funds to pay for interpreter fees that, uh, you know, we have done our best in ensuring that we're working closely with um, uh, with uh, Justice Gilda and her team of people. And so we understand uh, walking that fine line. And also just the last piece of it, the how we can, should keep costs reasonable for those who use these services, like you know our peace officers or our court system. And for us to understand that we either pay for it now or we pay for it later. That when we don't do a good job in interpreting and ensuring that people have the justice that they need, that when we have to go back and relitigate cases or we have to provide justice for those who did not get justice the first time, that the cost to us is much, much greater than the $50 per hour that would have been paid to our interpreters. And so I just want to make sure to remind us of that, that um, you know, th these things come uh, for a reason at a price for a reason is because justice does matter. And so with that, I just want to say thank you all for hearing this. And I look uh, forward to your support and ensuring that we do uh, pay our court interpreters the, uh, the pay that they deserve. And it's been a long time overdue. So thank you so much. Uh, thank you. Definitely a very highly skilled uh, position uh, to do that work. And I do want to thank our testifiers uh, for being here today and for the work that they do. It's actually um, a, 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 at least one familiar face from my work in Hennepin County and uh, very much appreciate the work that you all do and how important you are um, as we seek justice uh, within our court system. So thank you very much. We'll renew Representative Her's motion. And with that, 972 is laid over uh, for possible inclusion in the Judiciary Finance Omnibus Bill. And uh, that was our last bill. Uh, members, I'll still be able to bring my kids to school this morning. Uh, I do want to note that our hearing schedule will be slightly different next week. Um, we'll be meeting, our next meeting will actually not be until Thursday. And uh, the agenda will be posted early next week, if not sooner. And then we will also be meeting on Friday to me make up for the um, not meeting on Tuesday next week. So uh, please plan accordingly, members. And thank you very much for another productive week. With that, we are adjourned.